UFC Vegas 97, we have 12 fights headlined by Gilbert Burns taking on Sean Brady, and we are back in the Apex, but this is one of the best Apex cards all year. I am really looking forward to these fights, so let me know in the comments below if you have any bets already locked in. I already have five myself. Make sure you like, like the video, it helps out the channel a lot, and click subscribe. Turn those post notifications on because I got a lot of content dropping all week. I just dropped my top 15 goats of all time in MMA. I also have the live show dropping tomorrow. If you don't catch it live, make sure you go to my channel, go over to the live tab, and you can re-watch the replay. And you can not only see my perspective, but I've been taking some of your favorite handicappers in the MMA community, bringing them on, and they're giving their favorite bets on every single fight on the card. So make sure you don't miss that. Let's get into it though, man. First fight on the card. We got Zygamantis Ramaska taking on Nathan Fletcher, and I know I have broken down this fight twice already, so let's get right into it, man. Um, I'm going to keep this a little short and sweet because of that, but I'm still on the underdog. I still have Ramaska. I'm not going to bet this fight, I don't think. Um, I haven't been super impressed with these guys. They both were on the Ultimate Fighter, of course. Both had injuries. Um, I think it was Ramaska was his orbital and with Fletcher, I think he broke, he well, no, he broke a bone in his leg. I can't remember which one, but broke his leg. Um, then when they tried to book it uh, for the finale, Fletcher um, had to pull out with, I believe, staff. He, they never confirmed it, but if you watched him in the way in, I know this gets thrown out a lot, but there was pretty clear staff on his arm. So um, they ended up canceling that fight. Here he is again. I still think Ramaska probably should be the favorite. I'm kind of surprised that he's the underdog. Um, I mean, I do think Fletcher probably could land a couple takedowns. I just he's a de he's got some decent submission skills, solid jujitsu. I just don't know if it's gonna be that easy for him to submit Ramaska, whose jujitsu doesn't seem too. I mean, he's definitely more of a striker, but I don't think Fletcher's just gonna take him down, have his way with him think he probably can get a couple takedowns but i think ramaska's live to find the ko i think he also could win a volume based decision the the takedowns do scare me a little bit and i'm not super impressed with either i i just think this is a little lower level fight but respect to both these guys you know ultimate fighter is no easy task so you know i'm glad they're getting a shot in the ufc maybe they'll come in looking you know leaps and bound better but you know i will pick ramaska to i think he probably will get the ko catch fletcher um, i've seen fletcher caught hurt before um and i think that could happen again so give me ramaska to get the ko and start this card with a bang maybe it goes to decision fletcher's pretty tough but i'm gonna say ramaska puts him out Gives him his second loss. We move on to the next fight. We got Andre Petrovsky taking on Dylan Budka. Budka, um, this guy really got a lot of crap for his last fight. It was his UFC debut, and he did take on uh, Carlos Almeida. Uh, I bet Almeida as an underdog, and uh, because Budka, the thing is, his game plan is to hold guys up against the cage, typically. He doesn't throw a lot of volume. His jiu-jitsu doesn't seem, I mean, I just haven't seen that it looked great. Um, so I kind of knew that wasn't going to be a tough matchup for Almeida unless he can just lay on him for three rounds. But, you know, he's had trouble getting takedowns in, you know, past fights against lower level competition. The thing about it, this fight is the line is just a little crazy for a guy like Petrovsky, um, who, you know, we've just, I mean, he got knocked out by a hip. You know, I still don't understand exactly what happened to that. Um... You know, he got knocked out in like one punch from Michelle Pereira. Now, it was short notice. Pereira's a beast. He's a freaking giant. He hits hard. I'll give you a little bit of a pass, but it's just when you're laying three to one on somebody, I want to know that they have some durability, and I also want to know that they have cardio, and I don't think Petrovsky really has either of those two things. Um, I'm not ready to say he has no cardio. He did go a decent 15 in his last fight, but that was... You know, it's a little easier to go 15 when you're dominating the fight with your wrestling and you're able to, you know, control position, take breaks when your opponent can't, you know, slow the pace of the fight down. 
you know, it definitely suited a guy like Petrovsky. Um, in this fight, I do think Budka probably, you know, he's the younger guy, the fresher guy. He's going to be hungry, especially coming off that last loss. I don't just mean in general, but, you know, I've been paying attention to this guy's social media. He's been, you know, I never try to put too much stock in pre-fight talk, but, you know, you can definitely tell he's not coming to collect a check. This dude's coming to win. He definitely has a chip on his shoulder from that last performance. You can tell. I mean, he is very confident he's going to come in here and spring the upset. And, you know, I understand why people are betting him. At, the, at these odds, I do think, you know, he probably has a durability edge, even though you do have to factor in he's coming off a knockout loss. He, he did get finished. I have seen him hurt in other fights. I've seen him struggle to get takedowns. I do think petrovsky has got the better jujitsu. I think it, it would really have to be an attritional thing here. I don't really see Bud Cub being able to implement his game plan in round one, but maybe towards round the end of round two, round three. I do think Bud Cub's live here. I think this line probably is a bit wide. Um, I just can't lay three to one on a guy who I would have to put a question mark next to his durability, and I would probably not even put a question mark. I'd probably just put a straight up negative next to his cardio. So, um you know, maybe if he can get on top early and implement his game plan, maybe he can, you know, last 15 hard. But I, I do think, uh, you know, Budka presents some problems. The only reason I can't, I at least haven't bet him yet, is the volume is low. It's not like he's shown some big power. And then it's like because he doesn't really have a huge jujitsu submission threat unless Petrovsky really gasses trying to wrestle him, which I do think Budka is not going to be easy to take down. So. You know, if that would really be Budka's path, is the striking's competitive, Petrovsky gas is trying to take him down, and Budka could take over at the end. I do think he probably could put Petrovsky up against the cage and wear on him a bit, especially in the later ends of the fight. So I'll pick Petrovsky because I just think he has the, you know, the much higher finish upside. And, you know, I, I want to hope that he's making the improvements and knows that I do feel like he's the more skilled guy. But Budka's young. You know, he's, like I said, chip on his shoulder. Going to have a cardio and durability edge at this point of his career at least. So I'll pick Petrovsky, but it is a, it is not one I'd be looking to bet my hard-earned money on. Next up, we got Jacqueline Amar. I'm taking on Vanessa Dumopoulos. Interesting fight. Dumopoulos trying to play the spoiler again because... You know, Morum's definitely a, a, a new addition to the division, but, you know, that last performance to dominate McKenna to beat her is one thing, you know. I'm not saying McKenna's a world beater, but to just submit her like that it was impressive. And, I mean, Jack, I mean, uh, Sam Hughes, you know, that's a tough girl. I know she's not, like, the most technical, the most skilled girl, but she's a junkyard dog, and, you know, I, that's not an easy uh, fight, especially as a, as a UFC debut. So, you know, Dumopoulos came in, sprung the upset against Ducote, um, you know, had another upset against Murata. Some people didn't think she won that fight, and honestly, some people didn't think she won against Ducote. The, even the K KK fight was decently competitive. The Oliveira fight was competitive. The Jin Yu Fry fight was a split. So she kind of has a trend to go to these close decisions, so... You know, if you're getting big plus money, then you're that's something where, you know, if it goes to a split decision and you got plus 300 on it, let alone, you know, better in some of these fights, you're clearly on the better end of it. That being said, at some point, the luck's going to run out. I mean, you could say, like, a, on the opposite of, like, a Bobby Green, maybe the judges just like this girl and they just tend to score for her well. I don't know what it is. You know, I'm not saying former careers or anything like that. They just love the stripper guard, but... Uh, no, I, I think uh, there is something to be said for that for sure. Just like some fighters just tend to have bad luck with the judges. Some some the judges do like. But, you know, in this fight, I do feel like Amorim's got a, a decent grappling advantage. I know Demopolis has held her own on the ground in times. Uh, you know, it, again, I hate to say it again, but people just love bringing it that she's got that stripper guard. You know, she's super flexible. She's super, you know she'll she's unorthodox on the on the mat not that she's got some huge jujitsu threats but you know she's pretty good and wily able to to get up and to not absorb crazy amounts of damage and you know uh i will say you know she's fighting for these wins and i mean she's not the most dangerous girl but you know it's something to be said when you when you know she's fought some decent competition and and some of these matchups have been on paper pretty tough and you know she's coming out on top so you can't 
It's not somebody, especially against a girl with less than 10 fights, I'm really looking to, to lay minus 350 on. But, you know, uh, I do feel like Amor should be able to get the takedowns, should be able to, you know, get the dominant position, potentially find the submission. And if she can't, just win minutes here. But, you know, I mean, you can't lay this kind of chalk in unranked women's MMA, especially against a girl. I mean, for one, with a girl who has let us down before, uh, you know, against probably a similar skilled opponent, and two, against somebody who has sprung the upset in this exact situation several times. Girl, they're trying to kind of build, got the pretty record, should win, big favorite, and Dumopoulos edges a split decision. Could that happen again? It very well could. I am tempted to lay that plus 275. I think it's like plus 260 now. I still think, you know, there's value on that. It's just part of me is like, this is going to be one of those like dogs that look solid. Uh, even if she gets submitted, she'll probably have some moments. It'll be decently competitive. But the luck's got to run out at some point, right? I don't know if it will this time. It's, you know, Dumopolis is always live, but I will pick a Morum. I'll pick her to win by submission, and we will move on to the next fight. We got Gabriel Santos taking on Yiza. Um, I've seen it's been pronounced a bunch of different ways, but I'm gonna go with that. Um, <clears throat> Yiza, we'll start with him. You know, he's another guy coming off the Asian regional scene over there in China. I went through and watched some of these fights, and you know, first should be said he's got some solid jiu-jitsu or at least opportunistic subs. You know. Decent diversity with it, the chokes, the arm bars, you know, uh, I've seen him sit back for some leg locks, but look, the reality is, man, like the road to the UFC, the, the and like we're going to be talking about with the fighter later on, and, and a lot of these Chinese promotions, you got to look at who this who these guys are fighting, and they're just guys who have never, they've never sniffed a takedown, they've never been to a wrestling class, they they don't know. They don't know how to spell jujitsu. Most of them are just guys that are cab drivers. That they are like, hey, we'll give you two thousand bucks to come in here and get beat up. All you, all you have to do is get taken down once and get submitted. Like I would fight Easy All tomorrow. I mean, <clears throat> it, you know, <laughs> for for especially contender series money. Hey, give me. Or UFC debut money? She, I'll do that on no, no, no camp. Uh, and you know, Gabriel Santos is a guy who I, I really do feel like this is the UFC kind of being like, all right, he's uh, you know, worst case scenario or not even worst, but you know, if you were to get the win, eh, cool. We got this Chinese guy. We're ch- we got to build some people up from that region. Uh, you know, he's got a pretty record, and it. And then on the other side of the token, it's like they've kind of done Gabriel Santos a little dirty. <clears throat> Comes into the UFC, debuts against Larone Murphy, gets split decision, decent decent performance there. Honestly, Larone Murphy's no chump, and they're like, okay, you went to split in your debut against Larone Murphy. Here's David Onama. Now I'm not saying Onama's a world beater, but that's a dangerous guy, and yeah, he gets he gets beat up. But you know, I mean. That's a pretty tough fight, man. And I think both those guys absolutely steamroll Yiza. I don't think this guy's that good. Now, yeah, if he takes Gabriel Santos down, especially early, of course that's going to be trouble. But I feel like Gabriel Santos can keep the fight on the feet. I wouldn't even be shocked if he got a takedown of his own. I'm not saying he will do that. I think he strikes. But, you know, I'm just... I. I don't get me wrong. Some of these performances, you know, he's doing exactly what he should do, and most of them. But they're just guys. I, I would, I would beat those guys up. I'm sorry, but like, I, I, I don't know if y'all have ever heard me say that on here. But some of these guys. Now, I'm. I also do have 30 pounds on these guys. I have trained for 10 years, so keep, you know. But I still never say that. But I, I will be. I can. You guys know I respect the fighters, okay? But I'm just saying. Go watch some of these guys he's fighting on this Chinese regional scene. They are guys that I could take down and submit. Now, yeah, could they knock me out? Yeah, I, I, you know, for sure. But, you know, could, I could take down half of those dudes and submit them. Okay, I also have 40 pounds on them. But that being said, they don't know how to spell jujitsu. 
these guys are like the second he does any sort of jujitsu on them, they're like, ah, just get me up out of here. Not all of them, but half of his fights have been against clear zero stripe white belts. Gabriel Santos should be able to just give him, it should just be too much for him. If he gets an early takedown, maybe he can find the sub. I just think Gabriel Santos is a much better fighter. Sprawl and brawl, land big shots. This dude's never fought anybody as good as Gabriel. I'm not saying Gabriel Santos is going to be a ranked guy in the UFC, but there's still a lot of room from ranked in the UFC to guy taxi driver in China. Okay, so... Give me Gabriel Santos. I know some people are going to be like, you're you're underselling him. Look again. He's looked good in some of these fights. But like beating up these bums tells me nothing. We just saw yesterday Igor Calvacanti. People were like, oh, you should have just picked him. He's a lock. You should have just bet him when he was 3-1. to one. Yeah, how'd that work out, dude? Dude was a complete fraud. That's exactly why I couldn't do it. Dude had fought absolutely nobody in cab drivers and, you know, 9-0, and and it told you nothing. And that's a prime example. Moving on, we got Andre Lima taking on Felipe Dos Santos. And if you didn't watch any of my live streams <clears throat> in the past week, and you didn't watch DFS by the Numbers podcast, who brought me on to do the live show early look, then you don't know and you missed the line, and I'm sorry. But I got Andre Lima at minus 110, and I said for a week that that line was not going to stay around. And I'm not always on point about how the line movement's going to work. You know, we can never always be right about that. But this is one I was like, that's not staying. I, when I looked at it, and, and hey, his chat didn't agree with me, so maybe I'll be wrong. But there were several, well, no, not all of them, but uh, he agreed with, I th- he was also, I don't know if he's betting him, but he, you know, we were both on him. But, um, uh, You know, a lot of people in his chat were like, oh, you're sleeping on Dos Santos. Don't get me wrong. Dos Santos is a guy I like. And he's a guy that whose style is a ton of fun to watch. So I'm a fan of his. And I've actually kind of, people were saying I was a Lima hater. I I bet Igor, talk about the worst way to ever lose a bet via bite. And then uh, the Raposo fight is not like that was super, you know, impressive. I, I think Raposa's pretty solid, but he's a tough dude with a you know a style that presents problems to a guy like Lima, who's obviously mostly a striker. But you know Dos Santos, he's got decent enough grappling, and this one lost Manel Cop. Like I'll give him a complete pass for that. Also beaten Victor Altamirano. Like even if it's a close fight, I you know Altamirano was a lot better than people give credit for. I actually think that's a legit win. Some, some solid wins uh, uh, over at LFA, too. I think he had more than just that one. I think he had another one. But, uh, you know, Andre Lima, his striking, I just think he's he's going to be the more technical striker here. And I just don't think Felipe Dos Santos is going to implement, you know, a heavy grappling approach. You know, maybe he could get a takedown, but I actually think Lima could get a takedown, too. I think that the wrestling's probably pretty competitive. And, you know, uh, I just I don't really see Dos Santos just taking him down and wrestling him heavy and I think that's the best way to beat Lima right now so unless obviously you're on his level of striking and technique wise you know I I don't really see that I think Dos Santos could catch him he's dangerous the way he fights I mean he's like classic shoot to box Diego Lima you know he's he's gonna go for the kill so will I be shocked if he catches Lima and was to knock him out no but Lima is a 25 year old dude with a hell of a chin on him Obviously, Dos Santos is super young, too, but I just feel like, uh, you know, I don't really see Lima getting, like, getting outstruck. So as long as he can just not get knocked out, then, you know, I really would, I'd be, I'd be pretty surprised if Felipe Dos Santos just pieced him up for 15 minutes. So I, I'm going to say Andre Lima is the just the better striker, and I think they're going to, in a fight that's going to stay on the feet. So give me Andre Lima here. I bet him at minus 110, and yeah, I'm sorry. The other bets I have on this card you can still get, but this one, yeah, I, that's, hey, turn those post notifications on, man. Click subscribe. I've been going live. So, um, you know, when I do j- my breakdowns, like the Wager Wars show, or when I do a betting breakdown with guests, I leave those up for the public. But, you know, when I'm just fight companioning, fight companioning or I'm just doing a quick live chat, 
giving my thoughts on fights, I, I just unlist those after because it'll flood up my account. So you got to catch those live. Turn those sub notifications on, all that good stuff. We move on to the biggest favorite in the card and potentially could end up the biggest favorite of all time. What is with that, man? Yesterday we just saw a 20 to 1, and man, that if I would have saw that the line got that crazy, I was going to bet it when she was like plus 700, and that's so me. I was kicking myself. Now, I did have the under two and a half in that fight, but man, I was kicking myself for not betting that because you guys know women's MMA, even just in general, if it's plus 1,000, like it's a cage fight, man. There's just never times. Like it's so rare that line should be like that, let alone an unranked women's MMA, let alone Dana White contender series MMA. And I'm glad I had the under because I knew that fight was getting finished, but kicking myself for not having the huge underdog and in this fight we got Isaac Dolgarian taking on Brendan Moreau and you know <laughs> do I think Dolgarian wins the fight of course um no hot take there okay he should be able to take Brendan Moreau down and submit him in the first round most likely he could also probably mount him and ground and pound him out the problem is man when you're betting potentially biggest favorite of all I mean Dude, there was like a day you could have got Moreau plus 1900 Dear Lord, man. Bet a hundred bucks and win nineteen hundred bucks. Bet a thousand bucks. Nineteen thousand bucks. Just to put it in perspective of people who don't bet. And the problem and I wish I could still get that. It's like thirteen plus thirteen hundred right now, and that's still crazy, but you know, uh Dolgarian, he should be the favorite. He, I think he does smash here. The problem is, like, when you're betting a favorite that big, <clears throat> you want to see a guy who can has the durability, has the cardio, and then has the clear path to victory. He's got the clear path to victory. He seems to have the durability, but that cardio, man. This is a guy who, in his very last, is is he's coming off of a fight where he destroyed somebody who was probably undersized for the division was destroying him now you could argue how the decision went whether you thought it was a draw whether you thought he won a lot of ways you could score that fight but no matter what he gassed to death he's lucky the ref didn't stop that fight because there was a point in that fight where he was getting big brothered so hard the dude was literally just like in the fetal position just about just getting just at the mercy of his opponent is that somebody you want to lay potential biggest favorite of all time odds on a guy with seven fights who in his very last fight could only fight for about eight minutes and then just completely i mean anybody could have beat him up a guy off the street in that third round could have knocked him out he had nothing now yeah he finishes the guy off the street and i get it you don't gotta i get it but if you can just be breathing air in the cage after seven and a half minutes. Now, he's 28 years old. I'm sure the last fight was humiliating for him, especially there was some trash talk going into that one. It was his first loss. He had it. He slipped right through his hand. I'm sure he has been just running miles every day. I'm sure he's trying to... He is. He's plenty young to make the improvements, but if this was these are arguments you could be making if he was minus 400 i would say well he's going to be working at that he's he's young he's going to be making improvements he's got all the we're not talking about minus 400 we're not even talking about minus 1000 we're talking about minus 2500 okay you can't bet i've already gone on too long brandon Moreau, i probably will be putting a little sprinkle on you all you gotta just just survive for seven minutes and it could get dicey at the end of the day man in mma you have to do yesterday was one of the only times ever a line gets that crazy and i don't play it yes in women's mma and and in men's it's it's sometimes can be a little justified not 25 to 1 but like 10 to 1 sometimes is a reason but, like, this is a cage fight, man. Dolgarin could twist an ankle. At, at, at 25 to 1, he could twist an ankle. If you're parlaying that, you're just doing it wrong, man. Don't do it. He should. I'm going to pick him by first-round sub. Next up, we got Rongzu taking on Chris Padilla. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I went on and on about that last one. This is a much... 
much more competitive, much more. In, in, well, it's good. The last one was going to be entertaining in a different way. Um, but you know, I, I'm into this fight. I like this. I, I like that Rong Zhu's back in the UFC. Um, he was the other guy I was talking about earlier on that Chinese regional scene, though. Look, I, I really I don't want to hate, but we got we got to talk about it. All right, road to the UFC. I I just don't care. And people will be like, oh, but look, nine nine and one, seven and zero. Oh. Yeah, go look at who those guys' wins are on. And, oh, but he beat the seven and zero oh guy. Beat you. You can take keep that chain going forever because it doesn't matter when the guys that they're beating beat other bums who beat other bums who beat other bums. Like, and I, you guys know me, man. I I, I even. I really try to stay positive and not talk trash to, to professional cage fighters. But like the reality is a lot of the people that these guys are beating aren't professional cage fighters. They're guys that were paid to go in there and get beat up. That is how the game works, sadly. And Rong Zhu, his striking is good. I mean, there are a lot of these guys over there in China can strike. And I, I really do think if this stays on the feet, he probably will knock Padilla out. Now, I'm not saying Padilla can't strike. His striking isn't bad, but Rong Zhu is at 24, and, you know, he was in the UFC a couple years ago, too. So, and his striking was good then. I didn't see all his road to the UFC fights, but I saw the last two, and I do think he's made improvements, and I do think, you know, at 24, I get it, you know. Like, I get why he's the favorite, he his striking was super sharp a couple sharp a couple years ago. His we got a pretty record. He's only got to be making improvements, right? I'm sure he has. I'm sure his striking is really good. The problem is, who the hell is he grappling with? And when is he having? Is, is he really? Is he going in there and getting those jujitsu classes in? If so, who's he getting them with? Is he doing it at all? Because that's hard enough to do out there, and you know. I, I do think he's taking his career more seriously. I've been trying to watch his social media and stuff. I'm sure he is trying to round out his game because he needs to, and he's not. He can't. He, he wouldn't be dumb, right? Like he's got. He's got thirty fights, and but Chris Padilla, like you know, I think you know. I feel like people have kind of like say, people have been saying, oh, he, he you know. This guy, James Yontop, you saw his last performance. Ah, it doesn't really mean. You know, Yontop's tough, man. He, he's pretty tough. And that last performance might not have been the prettiest, but, like, it's not like... Yontop's no bomb, you know? Like, that was a solid win, and the finish him is legit because Yontop, you know, durable, tough dude. And, you know, uh, I don't think he's a world beater on the map, but to submit him, it, it, it says something. And... You know, I will say I think Yontop's harder to submit than Ron Zhu. I think if he gets Ron Zhu down, you don't think he can get to his back and submit him? You think, who who do you think wins in a grappling match? Ron Zhu or James Yontop? Because I'll tell you, it's James Yontop. He, he would do what he wants to Ron Zhu on the mat. And he would also out-wrestle him. So... Obviously, that's MMA math, but I'm just saying, keep that in mind when you're getting a, a, a two-to-one dog. I just think Chris Padilla is just more well-rounded. I think he can stay safe on the feet and get the takedowns. I, you know, I, I just, I, I, I'm just not a big believer in these one-dimensional guys coming out, coming out of here. They're up against it, honestly. They're up against it because there's not a whole lot of wrestling or jujitsu out there, man. So all these guys that come in out the Chinese regional scene, I mean, Rong Zhu, like, especially, even more so than a lot of these other guys, his striking is very good. He's just, it's just one-dimensional, man. I think all Chris Padilla, if he gets a takedown with over two minutes, I really do think he can either land round winning at very least, win a round with ground and pound, or, at, you know, at best, get to the back and submit him. So, give me Chris Padilla, and I am going to take him by submission, and I bet him. Plus 230 on Bovada. I think that line's still there. If it's not, it's like plus 220. I think you jump on it, man. I th well, I won't tell anybody what to do, but I did. Next up, we got Trevor Peak taking on Yanal Ashmoos. Ashmoos. Um, man, it's, it is Trevor Peak fight week, and everybody loves him. 
and how could you not? This is going to be a fun fight, and, you know, it was a little surprising to see him as a favorite, though. I guess it's not, because he is a fan favorite. It's just, uh, you know, he's more of a guy you want to bet, because he is the epitome of a live dog, of a shit-eating wild man. He's going to come forward. He's going to throw, you know, axe, axe, fucking tomahawk strikes and freaking hammer fists from the feet. Uh, he's he's a psycho, man, in, in the best way possible. I would love to do an interview with him because the dude... I just would love to ask him a couple questions. Dude was out hunting like today. I saw on his Instagram and had, had blood on his face. Like did the like warrior paint. He's an interesting character. Ash Moos, on the other hand, you know, tough performance in his last one. I guess I should mention Tre- Trevor Peak's last performance. Uh, you know, I was on Campbell. I bet him. Jeez. He just was the better fighter. Peaks, not the most technical guy. He's just, he's super tough. But if you're also tough, then it could, if you're also tough, but you just have more depth to your game, like a guy like Campbell. Like Campbell might not have the greatest durability, but he is a tough dude, and he was just better, simply. Better on the feet, better wrestler, better jujitsu, just better. I don't, Trevor Peak is just all heart, man. Like, I like the guy a lot. He's all heart. Um, even the Chepe Mariscal loss, that's not bad, though. Mariscal's been on a roll. For Ash Moose, you know, Chris Duncan, you know, not not the worst loss, but not the best. Um, you know, obviously, both guys are pretty green, and I don't think Ash Moose is, like, the most technical guy ever either. But, you know, I do feel like, the more technical striker is, is Ash Moves. And then I just, I don't know, man. I think the grappling's probably pretty competitive, but I just don't really love the fight IQ from Trevor Peak when you're talking about, like, betting. You know, I love watching as entertainment, but I think it's, you know, he's a guy that I, I want to bet as, like, a decent underdog when, you know, he's fighting a guy that everybody's going to count him out, but he's always got that, you know, puncher's chance because of the way he fights. And puncher's chance gets thrown around too much, but he really is a guy that, like, he's somebody you want to bet in those scenarios because, you know, you give him big plus money, he's always, I mean, this dude could have a broken nose sideways, a broken hand, he's going to punch you in the head with it. I just think Ash Moos is the better fighter. I, I, I don't think Ash Moos is, uh, like, a world beater. He probably, no, if, I mean, I won't even say that, but. I I don't think he's fantastic at this point of his career, but you know he's 29. Both guys are. Oh, I'm I'm sure both guys are still making improvements. I just like where Ash Moose is at more so far in his game. I think he's a little bit more put together. Also, I gotta say, man, the strength and conditioning is being taken very seriously. Okay, the the creatine is being taken every morning by Ash Moose. He is following up practice every night with acai, with a nice acai bowl. That is all I will say. Dude is looking... At, I want to pull up the pictures, but like the, I've already gone on way longer than I intended to in this. I just think Ash Moose is the better fighter, and you're giving me plus money now. It is only plus 110, but I went ahead and bet that. The line's still there on Bet Online. It's pretty much plus 110 around that everywhere. And I, I just think we're getting the better fighter who's probably going to fight at more of a higher winning percentage game plan. And, you know, that's pretty much it. Fight IQ, a little bit more technical probably everywhere. Pete can knock out anybody. He can turn anything into a dogfight, but I'm getting the more technical, in my opinion, just the better fighter at plus money. That's pretty much the, the logic behind that. We move on to a short notice fight. Matt Schnell taking on Cody Durden. And uh, yeah, uh, I like this fight. I like this short notice booking. I'm a big fan of Durden. Shout out to my boy Dan. Uh, Best fight picks. Uh, Brings him on the show all the time and has made me even even bigger fan. I was already a fan, but you know, I know some people hate on him because he did the villain thing a little bit, but he's a cool guy, man. Go watch Dan's podcast and tell me he's not a likable, cool, humble guy. But you know, in this fight, it is at 135. It says flyweight, but uh, this is at 135 because it is short notice. Durden doesn't even have his team. I think his girl's in his corner. 
you know, match now, obviously coming off the knockout, but it is Ursig, like, who knocked him out, and then, oh, before that, Nikolai, who was top five, I think, at the time, or, like, top seven, Brandon Roy Val, it's like, you know, uh, he's fighting top guys, man, he's fighting dangerous guys, yeah, the chin, the chin is not great, you know, I bet him, uh, in that, uh, Oh my god, what's the, not, <laughs> speaking of wrong suit, it was yeah, Sumadarji. Oh my god, that was one of my favorite bet caches of all time. I had Match Now, and I either also had him on Moneyline, but I know for a fact I had him by sub. Oh my god, <laughs> because that's how Sumadarji loses. I might have doubled up, but I for sure had Match Now by sub at some crazy number, because he was a big underdog, and that's how he wins, and that's how Sumadarji loses, so... He was getting destroyed, and when he got that sub, I mean, I was screaming at the top of my lungs. And I will say, Durden has been submitted before. He has, you know, he's he's a kind of a wrestle boxer. He's got good wrestling, good hands, but he can be hit. And Match now, as you know, defense isn't great, but hey, his offense, he'll touch you up with shots and, you know, win a decision. Or he he can, you know, catch you in, in a submission and, you know, uh, He's a pretty big dude, you know. Durden's big too. I think they'll probably size up pretty well, but um, you know, one thirty-five. We'll see who that suits. I mean, Matchnell's the one who's getting a full training camp, and you know he is coming off a, lo- a knockout loss, but so is Durden. So, you know, it's an interesting fight, man. And you know, I do think Durden wins. I think he can get takedowns. I think he can knock Chanel out. But also, I see a path to victory for Snell. And, you know, you got Durden at 3-1. to one. I will be rooting for Durden, even though Matt Schnell seems like a cool guy, too. And, I, man, after what Chris Tyone did to him, like, dear Lord, man. He really needs some good things to happen to him. But it did suck to see Durden. I had a bet on him, too, so I'm biased. But I like Bruno Silva as well, so I'm really not that biased. That being said, he was winning the fight. He was looking amazing. He was beating Bruno up and... Bruno's such a dog and just found the shot, knocked him out. I swear I saw it in slow-mo right before it happened. I never say that, but, like, right before he threw that uppercut, I was like, like, he was he had, like, backed up against the cage. You could tell he was kind of taking a little break after the little grappling exchange. And I was like, he was, like, caught up against the cage. It was, like, a split second before he threw it. And I was like, I literally saw it in my head. I don't know why. It was just one of those moments. I was like, oh, no, 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 and then slept. Could that happen here? It could, but Machinel is not some huge power puncher. He could get knocked out himself. He could definitely catch Durden in a sub, though. Clip him with something, snatch up another one of them nasty triangles. It's possible, so I won't be betting 3-1, to one, but I will be rooting for my boy Durden. We move on to a freaking banger. This card is fire. I gotta say, this is probably the best Apex card of the year so far, but we got Kyle Nelson taking on Steve Garcia. Kyle Nelson on a three-fight win streak, looking good. The, the Blake Builder fight, yeah, not super big on Builder, but hey, he did what he had to do. Padilla, good win. <coughs> the Bill Aljao loss, maybe you say it was early. It probably was early, I'll say, whose fights aren't getting stopped early. Steve Garcia, because this dude puts you out. Four fights in a row, all knockouts. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a fun fight, man. You know, Kyle Nelson has kind of slowed down a little bit lately as far as, like, his pace he's trying to like you know be able to go 15 he used to get tired he used to kind of be a killer be killed guy and he's he seems like he's trying to like be a little bit more tame and you know be able to win rounds and hey it's been working for him um but in this fight man good luck slowing down the tempo sorry it's late here <sighs> i just i've been a crazy busy and then i couldn't drop the videos already later than i like to do it so i was like i've been dropping them early lately but you know I was like, I gotta get it out, can't wait. So, I am a little tired, but we rambling. Steve Garcia, you know, he's a freaking uh, bat, shit-eating wild man himself, like Trevor Peak, man. He's a He comes out like a bat out of hell and tries to knock you out, and he gets dropped all the time himself. I don't think he has the greatest chin, but what he makes up for in chin, kind of like Matt Schnell, but not quite as, quite as bad, is he does make up for in toughness, like Schnell, he might not have the best chin. I do think his chin's a little better than Schnell's, but um, both are tough. And Steve Garcia, like, he'll get dropped, but he's going to get up. you got to put him out-out. If you don't put him out-out, he will get up and proceed to get back to whooping your ass. And 
you know, I do think a guy like Steve is going to bring out the dog out of Kyle, and we'll see, you know, um, if if Kyle Nelson can can take that pace, take that pressure that, that Steve Garcia is going to put on him. And, you know, I just feel like the momentum for Steve right now is something serious. It was only a month and a half ago that he that he fought Sumo Choi, but it's not like he took a lot of shots in that. That, that was, especially for a Steve Garcia fight, pretty clean. He didn't really, I don't think he took too much damage. He got clipped a couple times, but nothing crazy. Um, I don't know, man. Kyle Nelson's tough. <coughs> the way Steve fights, could a guy who clearly has enough power catch him, knock him out? For sure he could, but I feel like Steve makes it five, man. I gotta say, do typically when these trends happen, you know, you want to kind of bet on them to end, but I really... I really feel like this is one where he's going to get it done again. So I won't be laying the minus 180 that he's sitting at on most books right now, I don't think, because I think that's about what it should be. Minus 160, minus 190, somewhere in that range. I probably would put it right at like under minus 200. Like minus 180, minus 200. I do think he should win, um, but I'm not, I don't see a ton of value. I think the line's pretty accurate. So give me Steve Garcia to make it five knockouts in a row. But I will not be betting that fight. We move on to the co-main event. We got Jessica Andrade taking on Natalia Silva. And I've already rambled a lot, so I won't go too far into this. But this is one where it's it, it, there's a lot of weirdness going on in this. I mean, Jessica Andrade, she was on, I mean, she's only 32, but you would think she's 50. <coughs> the the amount of time she's been fighting, been fighting the best girls in the world at all of the divisions. I mean, she's fought at 115, 125, and 135. All three of the divisions in the UFC. This girl will be going to the Hall of Fame, man. You have to. just If you're one of these people, it's like, oh, no, only... No, shut up. Like She's been fighting straight killers at three divisions. I don't care that she has losses. And not only that, but she puts girls away. She's probably the scariest woman <clears throat> as far... Well, no. There's Amanda Nunes. There's Cyborg. But, like... Probably the scariest 115er of all time. Like, you know, like she literally picked a girl up and slammed her on her head and knocked her out. Like, come on, man. You don't see that. She's also like the Carolina knockout. That was literally, that might have been the most brutal women knockout I've ever seen. Women's knockout. That being said, man, she went on a crazy bad loss, you know, streak getting finished left and right. Getting beat by Aaron Blanchfield's one thing, but getting like pieced up on the feet, that was a bad look, man. That was that was bad. And I actually talked about she was live in that situation. I don't think I bet her, but I was talking about like, oh man, yeah, she could she could land on the feet. But she did talk about after oh, I barely did any training and then it came out after I wanted to get into that, you know, oh, she's going through a divorce and she's taking all these bad matchups with little to no training and no no coaches around her and out of shape and depressed and she lost, like, all her money. Like, she was broke. And so she took all these fights for money so she could pay off this divorce. So now you're thinking, okay, well, now she's taken, like, five fights and like, how long? Like, a year and a half, five fights against all killers. <laughs> <clears throat> and she's got a couple wins, right? She looked good against Dirt. That's all good, right? Now you're hearing her talk about how she's like suing her manager. And I mean, so it's just like, are you taking these fights? This is another, you know, weird, probably kind of bad matchup a girl that not a lot of people besides the hardcores know about, but she's big, she's dangerous, she's good everywhere. And you're taking it, you know, is, is this because you need money again? I hate to say stuff like that. I really don't want it to. It's such a dark way to look at things. But, like, she said it out of her own mouth before. And now it seems like it's happening again. Like, she, she needs, she's, not only did she get robbed by her ex-wife. And, you know, some jokes I could say there. But, you know, hey, Jessica, pound it. You know what I mean? Keep your head up, girl. But, uh. Now she's getting robbed by her manager. You, you, honestly, it's not a laughing matter. It, that really does suck, man. I hope I hope she's all right. She's got like 50 freaking fights. She deserves to be compensated. She deserves to be taken care of, especially because she not only got like 50 fights, but she's, I mean, it's literally, I'm 40, I'm exaggerating. But um, it's also been against straight killers for like 10 years. 
at any division. Like, the girl's a savage, man. She deserves to be taken care of. I just think it's a bad matchup for her, man. If she comes in good, you know, I actually haven't been, like, a crap. I'm not super sold on Natalia Silva. I mean, I think she is good. She, these have been good wins, that Rujo win. But, you know, that's a girl's, eh. Andrea Lee, eh. Victoria Leonardo, eh. Blada, eh. Jasmine Jazz Davicius, okay. But that was five fights ago. I'm sure she's making improvements. We have seen her lose. We have seen her finish three times. It's tough, man. It's tough because she, even though she's newer to the UFC, she has been fighting for a while, you know, 23 fights. And, you know, 23 fights at 27, like, she's been getting this experience in. And, you know, I do think, you know, some of it is a little hype, some a little fanfare because she is marketable, I'll say. Um, but, you know, some of it is warranted, you know. She's, she seems very well-rounded, big for the division, going to have size on Andrade. Um, it's just tough. And now Andrade, I should mention, back up at 125. Um, you know, she's done work here, solid work in the past, but also, do I think it's her best division? No, she's 5-1. Of course not. Of course not, you know? <clears throat> so, I think Natalia Silva, it's her fight to lose, man, but, like, Jessica Andrade, like I said, she's one of the most dangerous women that I've ever fought. If she's coming in with a good camp, could she make it look like the Dern fight? I think Natalia Silva's a much better striker than Dern, but that being said... She is somebody who tends to want to get you down and get on top. And if she does that dog draw, she probably will get the finish, especially if it happens early. But if she doesn't, Andrade, one of the hardest hitters in women's MMA, could she catch her? She definitely could. The pick is Natalia Silva, though. We move on to the main event, man. I know this is my longest video I've done in a long time. Hey, we had a week off, even though I had Dana White Contender Series. I've been hyped to break this card down a week off, and now we got a banger best Apex card of the year. I'm hyped for it, so sorry I ran a little long. I will have my quick picks and favorite bets video coming out probably tomorrow night or Friday morning, so if you didn't make it this far. But we got a banger main event here, man. We got Gilbert Burns, who is getting a little up there, 38 years old, taking on like a new flavor. Well, not so new anymore, but he's still... You know, 31 at welterweight, plenty of time, and, you know, been around for a little bit, but also, you know, just kind of started to fight, you know, the Chiesa win was a little sketchy, even if you go way back to, uh, oh, wow, what's his name, um, Kurt, uh, wow, crazy, Court McGee, my bad, um, even that fight, I remember, like, yes, not, I was like, eh, not sold on this guy, could end up being kind of a sold but uh in this fight you know uh i will say sean brady he, he's young he's making he's making improvements and obviously looked a lot better in, against calvin gaslam but you know that's calvin gaslam a guy who where is he even at in his career anymore dude i mean probably the most unprofessional fighter of all time even though he seems like a great hang and i would probably love to just drink a couple beers and eat a couple tacos with my boy with my boy calvin and i'm not saying that don't be weird about that. I'm saying that because he literally does has a channel where he does that. Okay, don't be a freaking stupid and annoying in the comments. Though in this fight, man, it's like, oh, you can take Kelvin Gaslam down and submit him. Do you think it's gonna be that easy to take a guy like Gilbert down? Because you know, while I will give Sean a pass, I bet Bilal against him. I think I even got plus like plus money on that. It was either it was at least even money, but I'm pretty sure I got plus one ten on on Bilal. I'd have to go back and check, but, you know, so I'll give you a pass on that. That's the champ, the rightful champ. That being said, Sean Brady, like, people have been saying, oh, well, Gil Gilbert got dominated by Bilal. Yeah, guess what else he did? He went five rounds with Bilal. Guess who couldn't even go two rounds with Bilal? Sean Brady. And it's not like that was 17 fights ago. That was two fights ago. Bilal, the guy who doesn't finish anybody, the guy who can't stop getting hated on, unrightfully so, by the community. I guess if you want to just say, like, hey, man, your fights aren't entertaining. Okay, the Leon fight was. But if you want to say that, hey, I can't really knock you for that. But the guy's obviously very talented, very good. Um, yeah, man. 
that was two fights ago. You got beat up bad and finished. Now, I do think, you know, he has a point when he's saying, like, all these guys are saying fraud check. I lost to the champ. Like, for sure, for sure. But, like, getting knocked out in the second round by Bilal, especially because, like, people were like, oh, he never went down. That was an early stoppage. Hey, man, no. Go, go back and watch that. He was done. He had nothing left. He couldn't do anything. He was gassed. Now, does that mean he's always going to gas that quick? No. Maybe it was just, you know, he knew in there, like, mentally, like, oh, no. I'm getting touched up, and I can't take this guy down. He had never really dealt with that before. Do I think he can take Gilbert down? Probably. He's going to be a lot bigger than Bilal, for sure. He Well, not a lot, but he is big. He's the bigger guy here, for sure. And Gilbert's got good takedown defense, but I think Sean, you know, he probably can take him down. Even though the only people who have taken Gilbert down, I mean, I really try not to do this, but let's, one time, Zyra, we've already, we're, we've already gone the longest ever, right? Oh, I wanted to just, just pull this up real quick. I try, I really try not to do this, but look. Okay. Um, who has taken Gilbert Burns down? So Hamza Shamayev took him down twice. How'd that work out? He held him down for about mm, collective two seconds. Um, Damian Maya. Okay, two takedowns right before getting knocked out. Uh, anybody else? Jason Sago. Uh, about ten freaking eight seconds now. Eight years ago. Okay, how'd that work out? Got knocked out. Um, Michelle Prezeres. Okay, yeah, not the best, but that was a long time ago. And also, like, hey, in his day, Prezeris, solid enough. That was a long time ago, too. So, if your game plan is to go in here and take him down, it's also, like, I'm not even saying what the thing most people are saying. Like, hey, man, it's Gilbert Burns, like, former ADCC competitor, you know, really high-level black belt. I, you know, Gilbert Burns isn't somebody you just take down and don't have to worry about submissions coming up, getting swept, because you don't want to be on your back against Gilbert Burns. I know Sean Brady is a high-level grappler himself, but I don't care who you are. You don't want to be on your back with Gilbert Burns on top of you, especially when there's punches involved. So, I don't know, man. Who's the better striker? Hmm. I'm going to say Gilbert Burns. Who's got more power? Gilbert Burns. Who's... Got the better cardio? I mean, Gilbert Burns is 38. He did gas against JDM. Okay. So, this question marks. Both guys have gassed. Sean did gas in seven minutes, though. Let's, I've seen Gilbert go five rounds. The cardio could be a question mark. Sean Brady is 31. You know, a lot less miles on the tank. Gilbert Burns is running doing a podcast. He's coaching. He's maybe he is coming into a second part where it's time to unwind a little bit. But I don't know, man. I just think you're giving me like plus 165 right now on one book, one of my books. I think it was Bet and GM. Plus 165 on Gilbert Burns against the guy whose path to victory is to take you down and get on top of you. This is a five-round fight. Now, maybe you could say that that works against the 38-year-old who did gas out in his last fight. But I've seen Sean gas too. And if Sean can't take him down, or Sean doesn't want to take him down, because every time he does, he uses all his energy, and Gilbert either gets up or threatens a sweep, or, you know, he just can't do a whole lot because Burns is hard to hurt when you get on top of him. I mean, you know, I just think, you know, maybe the other question mark you could say is Burns' chin, his durability, especially at this age, but like, is Sean Brady going to be the one to test that? Sean Brady, who is he really hurt? Dude doesn't really even throw for power. He's just trying to get on top of you the whole time. I don't know, man. And then I would pull up the stats again, but we've already almost hit an hour. This is like 20 minutes longer than any video I've done in a while. So I will keep it at that, but I will say one last thing without showing the stats. Go ahead and look at their volume. Go ahead and, and compare their volume. The strikes landed. This is going to be a five-round fight, and if there's somehow not a finish, which I do think there's going to be, who do you think is going to win a lot of these rounds? I mean, unless Brady puts this, you know, high, high-level black belt on his back for, you know, three and a half rounds, do you really think he's going to 
when on the numbers on the feet, I mean, unless we see something we haven't seen before, the numbers would indicate no. The numbers would indicate Burns is tough to take down, and if you do take him down, he's even tougher to control. Even Hamzat couldn't control him, a guy who is a big middleweight. And now we're going to go and fight Sean Brady and expect him to just ragdoll this guy? I get he's a little older now, but I don't know, man. I think there's way too many question marks to be laying chalk like that. I get it. If he was like minus 110, I would understand because of, you know, losses and age and durability and yada yada, five rounds. But yeah, give me Gilbert Burns, man. I will pick him straight up. I am going to pick him by knockout. Uh, five rounds, man. If I just think there's a lot of ways this can, this can go wrong for Sean Brady. So I haven't bet it yet because it's only going in my direction. And the way these lines have been going lately... Same reason I haven't bet that Dolgarian fight yet, because even though I that 19-1 to 1 was there for a split second, most of these times lately, everybody's just parlaying these favorites. So, let the parlay boys get at it. If I was parlaying, there'd be a couple guys on this card that maybe, you know, hey, we already went long enough, why not? Uh, you know, do I think, you know, I wouldn't hate a Santos being thrown into a parlay at this point. Maybe you do a Lima since you've missed the line. You know, uh... Outside of that, you know, maybe a Durden, but I do see some past the victory for Chanel, so that can be tough. I do think Steve wins, but see, that's why I'm not a big parlay guy. But I'll let me run through my picks real quick. I got Gilbert, underdog one, by knockout. Um, Natalia Silva, Steve Garcia, knockout. Um, Cody Durden, Yanel Ashmoos, underdog number two. Chris Padilla, underdog number three. Isaac Dolgarian, Andre Lima. Gabriel Santos, um, we got Jacqueline Amora, Andre Petrosky, and Zygamantas Ramaska, underdog number four, 12 fights, four underdogs, four bets, oh, oh, and let me run through my bets one last time, I got Lima, minus 110, Padilla, plus 230, Ash Moose, plus 110, um, main event does not go to decision, I didn't touch on that, I bet that minus 115, you can still get that, go Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying that. See, <laughs> I will also be betting Burns. So, uh, maybe plus one. Sorry about that. Maybe plus 165. Uh, but if, hey, if it keeps going, I'll happily take even better. We'll see. That's where my head's at, man. Sorry I went so long, but I'm tired and I'm rambling and it's been a week off and this is a great card. So like the video, click subscribe, check out all the content I got dropping all week. I do this all the time. I love doing it. Don't typically run on this long, but hey, it's been fun. As always, glad to be back. Enjoy the fights. I'll see you later on in the week tomorrow. And until then, peace.